Jo, uh, hi. Um, wie immer hier auf lasergucknland 129.202.1c7.134, der Minecraft Vanilla Server. Und wir pumpen heute DEFCON 25 X Logic X Assembly Language ist too high level. Yeah, Alrighty. Okay. And then uh, now I'm going to be talking about how assembly language uh, in certain situations can be too high level. And uh, just a note in the speaker room back there, um, there's minor disasters, so my Cali image broke, but uh, whatever, I'm going to roll past that. I got screenshots, so it's no big deal. But um, first, before I begin, simple uh, shouts. To start with, most importantly, um, the person that helped me with all the art you're going to see in here, Kurt Cocaine. Uh, my fiance, um, she's back there right now, not wearing an hamburger or mus. Um, but it was just funny side note. I know my handle is kind of straight edge, and it's kind of ironic that hers has the name cocaine in it. <laughs> but um, also, back at that last hacker space that I uh, hacked out of in the West Village, um, NYC 2600, um, also DC 201 because DEFCON. Um, currently, we don't have a NYC chapter, so if we go over to Jersey for that. Und was leuchtet denn da? Das sieht ja mystisch sure. aus. Um, about me, in, in the context of this slide, not about me in general, but as a teenager in the 90s on Windows 3.1, I wanted to learn to program, but I wasn't exposed to any kind of programming languages. I, I didn't know about BDS numbers to even dial. I was like in a little silo. Um, but I, I kind of had the idea that programmers hmm. still had to be editable in some kind of language, some kind of editor. So I opened up Notepad and, you know, naively dragged calc into Notepad to see if I can edit this Irgendwie program. Sieht's ziemlich hell aus. Um, and when I saw Bruder, war diese Delfin und Crack, ey. Whatever this is, it's garbage, but I want to. So, eventually, as a side note, I, I did uh, start so wieder so viel introduction. And I kept this column last year, I live demo. Was ist das denn? Schiff? In Windows 3.1, stock, uh, using debug. Um, but back to my journey of assembly language, um, I, when I first tried to learn assembly language, um, I tried on my CI-82, just because I thought it would be simple, um, the Z80 chip, and uh, I followed the tutorial to clear the, um, the screen, and that worked out great, and then when I tried to adventure on my own to clear the memory, so I gave up on that, and then I went, when I was in college, I learned officially, um, or academically, on a Motorola chip, the M68 HT11. Um, and that's when I really learned assembly and really fell in love with it and really learned the relationship between machine code and assembly language because one of the first challenges I gave myself was to write a, you know, a self-modifying or a kind of like a virus, but not really, just a program that would call write itself back in the memory and execute it itself. And to do that, you have to understand the machine code side of it, not just the assembly side of it. Okay. Um, Suspicious and then, uh, deal. He, uh, he used to come to our Phoenix 2600 meetings when I used to live in Phoenix, and he's the one that got me into all things Parallax. He gave me my first TNT's experience and using the, um, the propeller chip and I learned assembly on it and wrote some audio stuff. And I've also learned the machine uh, code for this as well and the relationship is fairly one to one. Um, and then uh, down the road my previous employer Vaughn told me to do gram training, uh, the gram certification to stand. So this uh, is actually formally learned to uh, the last architecture that I've learned, not the first one. Um, and the screenshot is all the, the manuals for uh, Intel for x86. Um, I've actually read them all cover to cover, um, except for volume four, which I guess is a new thing now. So to get into this a little bit, I want to start with um, my feelings of assembly language and machine code in x86 and its relationship to each other. Um, so I introduced you to my mental image of the InfoSec bro. Um, is there noch was drin? Explains, um, oversimplifies things. Um, so here's, here's like a scenario that, you know, it's like I'm witnessing this. Um, this is kind of a quote of the type of things that you hear from a, a bro spinner about assembly language. Seeing it's a one-to-one -one mapping, they're basically the same thing. You can take machine code and you know exactly what assembly it is. Um, it's, just, it's just ones and zeros, you know, he's saying. Um, there's no other layers of abstraction between assembly and the processor. That's okay. Um, the downside is I, I took all these, I didn't make these quotes up, I took them all out of this book. 
And I'm sorry, I know um, a lot of the authors are uh, DEF CON attendees. I honestly think that, uh, I, I, no, but I don't blame the authors, actually. Um, and even, even one of the authors blames the publisher. This is an Amazon review. The one that shows at the top of this book is from one of the authors of the book. And at the very end, he said, well, I can't blame the zoom here. That's the thing he says. So this talk is about how assembly language and machine code is not one to one, and I'm going to go into this in gruesome detail. Have ich das heute? So here's the disappointing part. I had an awesome little example in Kali. Um, it, it was just a toy uh, vulnerable program, toy exploit. Um, it wasn't like I was trying to drop no data. It was just just to demonstrate what you could do with raw machine code uh, with an understanding of it. So. Um, this, at least, at least I had a screenshot of like one of the, the crucial parts of debugging the vulnerable program. Um, but what the program does, and just as a point of reference, if you guys wanted to play with it yourself, you can. Um, so at least put a little note up here, and I'll make it bigified. Um, it's also in a recent, uh, the most recent issue of 2600. Um, the so but crazy. The vulnerable program is called Kitty because I call it that because it's just like cat. It just has out a predefined text file, which is file.txt. Um, and it has like a limited buffer on the stack of 16 bytes, like purposely naive. And so file.txt is the, the exploit for it. So, and to run it, you just, you know, run Kitty. Yeah. So the crucial part that I was talking about here is this move ECX, get, uh, removing ESP to ECX, and then jumping to ECX. It's kind of like your typical jump ESP, but indirectly, we're only we weren't able to find a jump ESP anywhere. So we were able to find this in our theoretical example of moving an ESP to ECX, and now ECX has ESP, so now you can jump to ECX. Um, the crucial thing to note here, though, is the machine code, ABCC, which is so blurry. But if you were to use a tool like Mask and Shell, and you typed in move ECX ESP, you're not going to get ABCC. You won't. Um, that's the, the thing that Mask and Shell gives is officially what Intel says you should do, but there's redundancies. Um, and I'm not really saving this for last. I'll just show you the tool that I was talking about in the program guide, and I'm going to jump in and out of it. But if I do move ECX ESP, this is what my tool does. It's like Mask and Shell. And at that top, it gives 891. That's what your Mask and Shell is going to give. But my tool, IRAS, or the Independent Redundant Assembler, also gives one of the alternates, ABCC. And of course, some other instructions will see there's way more um, alternates for some instructions. You'll have like eight variations that work. So some of the tools I'm going to use in this talk, IRAS, and you saw it. And the ALP is another tool that allows you to program in direct machine code. So I can say 3, 2, C0, like direct machine code, and it tells me what this is, XOR AL AL. Or I mean, I can also type 3, 0, C0, you know, different machine code. <laughs> but it's still XOR AL. Yeah, it's not really the portable format, but... So, I don't know. The one, one kind of block here. We're looking at the add instruction. Ich könnte ja, ich könnte ja irgendwas craften. Digga, gehen wir nicht auf den Sack jetzt hier. 04 is machine code in this context for add, in, in this context add uh, an 8 byte value or an 8 bit value to AL register. So, this is what it looks like in the debugger. Uh, uh, you have the 04 for add, and 42 is our data that we want to add into AL, and in decimal is 66, so you see over there. And we step through one step, so you see DAX has uh, 42. And that's what we want. Um, to take it up a notch, uh, let's do an uh, increment. 40 is our machine code for that. And uh, really, 40 is machine code for the first register to increment, which is. EAX, and then you go over EAX, C, D, B, ESP, D, B, D, E, S, I, E, I. So 4.1 would it correspond to ECX, 4.2 would uh, correspond to EDX, and, and it works like that. So there's all of them. 4.0 through 4.7, that's implementing all of our 32-bit registers. Unless you're 64-bit, and then it's the prefix, and it gets confusing. Um, but then, taking it up one more level, we got the move instruction. So it's kind of like increment where we have B, and then the 0, 1, 2, 3 after B is what a register it corresponds to. And then we also add the immediate byte we want to move into the register. So the registers for this one being that there are uh, 8 bit values, those are the registers in order, and this is our variation for that. So we have B0 for AL, B1 for CL, and that's what the machine code looks like corresponding. However, 
this to the left is that original screenshot, and to the right it has the same assembly but completely different machine code. Ja gut, der Talk äh, habe ich mir auch schon gedacht, aber da kommt es halt auch wieder gar nichts mit. So. So the assembly in this example is level. The machine code is a level, high level, and so the, the mathematical concepts that we're trying to demonstrate with this instruction, um, or how to you know, do math in base one and base zero, because that makes sense. So this is what this instruction is supposed to do um, by default. Um, it takes these, uh, a, a, um, like a two byte value, it splits them up, and we're not really adding them together, we're kind of like smashing them together. To, like we're taking the BCD values and making it um, together as seven, nine. And the hex value for that, for that is what goes back into that register. In this case, it's AX, so the result goes into the AL register. So that's what it does, what it's supposed to do. But you know, it's like BCE, like you have a byte reach value that could go way above 10, or weird things like that. And another weird thing is, it's, it's a base 10 conversion, but um, in this case, you know, D5 is AAD, and then you get this 0A that shows up after it, that we don't actually get the same assembly language, but machine code you can. And Intel says you can do that too, but you have to do it in machine code. So we can mess around with that and do different bases, which is kind of cool. So let's do that. Base 6, we have a couple base 6 values that are valid. Um, we smash them together like that. That's the hex value of it, and it goes in like that. And there's a screenshot of it. Um, I, uh, of course, I step through so you see that that value actually does show up in EAS, the 1-7. Um, base 2, this is even easier. You know, 1 plus 1, we get that 1-1 one, one together. That's 3, you know, we put that back in there, and you know, that works too. Um, so now let's get ignorant. Um, we're going to use invalid values. So 0, 5, and 6F, like 6F is base something really, really high. And in this case, it's not hex. It's like if you can imagine 6, like that value, that the hundreds up, that would be, you have to have that many symbols for it. So we take those values separately. We kind of add them together. I don't know how to visually represent that, but that's the closest I get for that. And then by the process of magic, we get A1, and it goes in there, and that's actually what happens. Not an error, that's what happens. We'll get to y in a second, but uh, let's try base 1 because that's that's a thing. Uh, we split those values up. In this case, one, I don't know. Zero is the only valid character, right? Uh, we split them apart and together, we get zero. I mean, whatever, that's like no surprise there, but that's what happens for that. Base 1, best then. What about base 0? Like, what symbol do you have for base 0? And so I, just, that, I don't even know what to choose. So I just put B then for my value and separate those out. Dieser Fluss ist wirklich lang, ist ja crazy. Oh oh. It's like a lookup table. You know, you align one of your operands up here, and then the other operand, which could be a pointer over here, and you just find where it aligns to in the table. Um, 
So we're going to work through all these examples to make this clear, to see the proof of concept. For all these examples in the main store, um, yeah, so they're consistent. So you know what the free one and all these machine code examples refer to. And by that, I mean the free one up here. Right? So our example is XOR EAX with EDX. So the EDX I'm talking about in the table for that second operand is this EDX here. And the EAX, which is not a pointer, it's just a register, we find it down here. And if we follow it on the table, we end up with this so zero crazy. Over ah. And that's our these are over there. So that's how that works. That's what's happening. And the is converting it like that. Um, if we do have store ECX as a pointer uh, in EAX, then first of all, we have this EAX. Yeah, ich würde ja so gefickt gerade. Vor allem gegen den Kaktus geslackt. So first of all, um, the easy part, that EAX up there. Now we need to find this, this um, second section here is the one that has all the 8-bit displacements because that's the displacement we're using. And then we gotta just find that one that's ESI. So 8-bit displacement, ESI. So that's what gives us our 4-6 machine code here. Yeah, these are and then we have our 3-1, and then 4-2 is just referring to that part right there. Die snacken mich gerade hart. And then to get more complicated, uh, This is kind of like the, the previous example when we were doing a 32 bit displacement on the 8 bit. Um, I only included it because I wanted to show Andy in this. So, first of all, there's the ESP part, that's easy. Um, and then EDX plus the 32 bit displacement. And it's our A3 right here. So, we have our 31 A3. What the fuck damn is this? Delete. Do you see kind of backwards there? That's Intel being little Andy. It's little Andy. I call it reverse Indian myself because it doesn't make sense. I'm um, the guy that learned on Motorola at all. It's the, the, the right way in my mind. Um, so then there's XOR, which is just one displacement here. Um, I have EAX up here, and this is where I can do just a displacement. We don't have the option to do an 8 bit displacement, but we don't have 32 bits, which is fine, so we just add it with zeros. And that's what we have. We have our 31 right here. And then we take that 5 from the machine code, and that's our 5 there. And then our 0, 0, 0, you know, reverse, um, and our 4, 2 at the end. So that's that. Sugar cane. Also, this is a really tedious example. I just want to show you how, like, kind of complicated it can get. Um, in this case, we're going to do scales. So this means that we're going to have to use the SIB table after the, the Mod RM. That, that scale meaning ETX times 4. So first of all, the AAX, that second one, that's easy. Um, and then, you know that we're going to have an EBIT displacement, you know we're going to do an ECX scale. Um, this dash dash thing is what means use the SIP table. So this is a, the dash dash that has EBIT displacement, which is what we want. And then we'll deal with the rest of the EBIT and the SIP table. So here we are on the SIP table, different table. A different table. The EDX, we select up here for that first EDX. And the ECX times 4, we find there. And that's what we're going to get our right there. And that's why we have our 3 1, 4 4 from the mod, RM table, 8 E from the SIP table, and 4 2. Digga, wenn da jetzt wieder keine Dias drin sind, das ist so. Das kann mir doch keiner erzählen, dass sie mittlerweile so oft sind und so worthless. Das ist einfach richtig waste of time. Früher hat man sich noch über ein Dorf gefunden und geile Snacks gesnackt. Aber mittlerweile. Boah, diese Hungerzombies. Die, die sind ja Gift. Digga, stirbt von den Creeper. Bang. Nice. S. So we have our three one for XOR. Oh, da unten ist noch ein Feld. Haben wir endlich was? Okay, Bücher, ja. <lacht> Hat er jetzt nicht gedroppt, den Spock. To put in the base register with no scale register, but we could do that with other registers other than the ASP. So that was just a huge doing of EAX. Mm. So the first instruction there is how you should encode that, 3100, but these are all the other alternative ways to do it with the SID byte. I mean, of course, the assembler is not going to do that because that's more bytes. You know? I don't know if I. How about scaling the ASP register? 
Nope, uh, you just can't. can't. It's, it's just impossible. What you try to do in an assembler, it's going to give you an error. Ich glaube, ich behalte die im Heuballenformat. Ich glaube, es ist sogar effizienter, als Brot zu craften. Das ist sehr wahrscheinlich. Hier haben wir noch meine Hoe dabei. Ich bin einfach ein True Farmer. Irgendwo war noch ein bisschen, ja, Heuballen. Ich bin noch irgendwas. Okay, Buch. Das was? Kriegst du die mit Silk Touch oder wie? Krass, ich habe schon über einen Stack Bücher. Ah ja, das ist ja jetzt so ein Ding, ne? Boah, sind wir weit nach links abgedriftet. Ja, ich weiß, ich bin wasty, was die Boote angeht. Um, in the case of this, like for uh, compare, 3B is the encoding for moving a register or a pointer into a register. And then the second one, 3.9, is moving just a register into either a register or a pointer. Um, because of uh, register can be encoded in both, you got a redundancy. Um, and this is actually the exact type of redundancy that I had in the screenshot before with that toy exploitable program. That's why that worked, was because of this redundancy. Um, and then this is just the modern M table showing um, that C0 encoding for the EAX and EAX. Um, some more interpretive dance with the SIB byte. Uh, say we did EAX times two. Um, is it the same as EAX plus EAX? Well, um, to an assembler, I'm just going to actually write this in source. And this is what it looks like when it gets disassembled. So the assembler is choosing to encode the EAX times two as EAX plus the AX. It's ignoring you and doing an interpretive dance. The reason for that is if you were to direct the code in, in machine code, uh, using the SIB byte, doing multiply by two, it actually requires more machine code to do it. And I should take a step back and say, all this experimentation, I say that I do it directly in machine code. Um, the way I do that is with this tool that I wrote, um, MDELF, that I just showed you um, earlier. Um, so what I could do was a 330 And I get that representation there. Um, this is an interactive mode, so what I, what I originally wrote this for was to write out a whole program in machine code, and it actually spits out an ELF executable. Um, so you can use it for that too. 
Um, so just, just point of reference, that's that tool. Um, NASM is tolerant to your bullshit. So you can write something like EAX times five, even though you can only do times one, times two, times four, times eight. Um, you can do EAX times two minus EAX, even though minus isn't a thing at all. Because NASM is smart, it's cool, I praise NASM. EAX times five is the same thing, pretty much as EAX plus EAX times four, which is a thing. And EAX times two minus EAX is just EAX, and that's a thing. So NASM's tolerant to your bullshit, and we'll do that too. Um, so now I'm kind of done with the mod RM as a big thing. Now I'm just going to go through all kinds of random miscellaneous loose ends, and when I'm done with all that, um, I'll talk about the tool more. Like, I wrote a tool so you don't have to think about this stuff, uh, so it's automated, so you can go from NASM shell to maybe IRASM for other things. Um, first of all, I'm going to talk about test, this particular test encoding of moving a register or a pointer to um, a 32-bit register. It's actually not a thing. There's no encoding for it, although you can still write assembly like it. But before I do that, to show kind of an analogy, compare, I'm showing the two different uh, compares that you have. So what it looks like, this is me doing both forms of that, you know, a pointer to a register and then a register to a pointer. This is a disassembling it, we see it's different and everything. But then we go back to this test thing. So say we really did try to do, in the first case, um, a pointer to a register. This is what we get. Um, the assembler gives you the same thing for both. Um, why is that? Well. Um, Intel doesn't have an encoding for that first one. Um, this is the only encoding that it has. So why is that? Well, with compare and test, was it my Hühnchen? Subtraction, but it doesn't do the subtracting. It just sets Ach so, the flags. Ich gegeben, oder? Test is like an and, but it doesn't do the anding. It just sets the flags. Compare if we were to look at doing a subtraction. If we do five minus three or three minus five, like we switch them around, the result is different. Whereas with test, if we switch those around, it's the same thing either way. Hence, why you only need one encoding. And then this is just kind of a miscellaneous 64-bit uh, uh, trick. Earlier, I was saying how with uh, increments, it's like 40 through uh, you know 47. Well, if you're 64-bit, that 40 through actually 4F is actually a prefix that modifies the instruction after. Now for that, uh, let's talk about fencing, um, which I think is kind of like a semaphore, but I might be completely off on that because I've never used this defense uh, instruction. But this is our Intel uh, like manual screenshots of the machine code for L fence, S fence, and uh, M fence. And this is me writing those instructions, um, and then I'm you know uh, disassembling it. And this is the result I get. This is logical. This is the machine code that the manual gave. Um, but then there's also this. Um, so if I go in here, we have like a bunch of L fences, and you'll notice that like the first part's the same. And then you got E A, E nine, E A, E B. Um, and the same kind of thing with other ones. It's like it starts with this F0 and just kind of increments from there. This is normal. This is fine. It says Intel. It's not a weird thing that I discovered. Intel says you can do it, so I did it, and it works. And I don't know why it's there, but it works. Um, so you can write some more machine code that you can't assembly, because assembly's too high level. Um, so here's another thing. Um, to make things easier for uh, the, the programmer, or, or actually more kind of, not, not for the programmer, for the processor, it's less bytes. Because it's so common, to compare a value with the AL register and AX and EAX, there's a specific encoding just for it. So even though you can do an 8-bit register or 16 or 32-bit with a register or a pointer, in this case, AL is so popular that it gets its own machine code. But as you're probably guessing now, of course you can encode AL with that. So because of that, here's some more redundancies. Similar to that with uh, rotating instructions and bit shifting instructions, it's really common to shift by just one. Um, even though they have the encoding here to do an 8-bit value, like you can shift by, weirdly enough, you can shift at a full like 255 values, which doesn't make sense for a register that's like, you know, too small to actually make a difference for that. Um, but anyway, same kind of thing. It gives me more redundancies here. There's also branches where there's no reason I'd ever want to use it other than the fact that Intel says there's no mnemonics for it. So of course I want to write a branch hint because I can't write a branch hint in assembly. Um, a branch hint is just a, a prefix that you put in front of any instruction that would branch. So in this case, I put the, the 3D in here and it tells the processor that, you know, that hints the processor that there might be a branch, but I don't even know if it's even used anymore, but whatever you can. Um, so I really like this one because in the manual, this instruction, machine code wise, doesn't exist, but it does. To me, it does. Um, so, this is 
writing an example uh, just in source here. Um, and the reason that Intel doesn't have an encoding for uh, the shift arithmetic left is because it's logically the same as just shift left. So they really only use one encoding for it. So if I try to do a move and then the shift left and the shift the arithmetic left, when I disassemble it, my shifts that I had both got converted to a shift left. If you look to the Intel manual and look at the machine encoding for it, it is identical for both of these instructions. Um, that's weird. Um, and that, that four, that slash four thing you saw is really represented by this binary one zero zero. And they throw this SHL and SAL in the same part of the table. And then what I see though, and what some of you might be seeing if you're sitting close enough to see this table, is there's a blank spot over here. And I'll make note of this number, six. So I'm gonna try to do it manually here. This is making that, instead of slash four, making those four bytes, um, or making that, that four part of the byte a six, and I now have SAL, and here's all the different versions of it. So now I can do SAL, so mission accomplished with that. Um, there's a hidden test. I like looking at these tables and seeing empty things to try to see what it actually does. It um, is all, This blank part here is actually just a test, just like the one right next to it, Although some disassemblers can't even disassemble it. Um, me using EDB, it just says it's a data word. And then there's a move right after it. Well, really, this is actually machine code for test EAX. And this move isn't even a move. It's actually the um, operands for that test instruction. And when you step through it and execute it, um, execute it, it actually does run as a test. So if you're looking at this disassembly, um, you'd be mistaken at what it actually does. Um, there is no move. Um, I call this set of slides load ineffective address, even though the instruction really means load effective address. Um, and what it really does, I'll zoom into this instruction here, is it doesn't really treat this as a pointer normally, it just kind of does a mathematical operation. So whatever is in um, RAX, whatever is in RBX, it adds them, multiplies RBX times eight, and adds 10 to this. I mean, this is how I um, wrote this instruction, but you can use any pointer math you want. Um, and then it takes whatever that value is and literally puts it in EAX. And that's what that's used for. So in this case, like um, RAX you know, is five, or I'll start with RBX. RBX is 30 times eight um, plus 10 plus five will get you 255. And that's why when I ran through all the way, we have FF 255 as a result. That's what it's supposed to do. But really to do this kind of instruction, it assumes that the second operand is a pointer and it assumes that the first operand is a register. If you write anything else, it's not gonna work and it's gonna give you an error. So, you know, I try to do something else because of course I wanna to try to do the wrong things. I'm a hacker, I wanna see what the wrong things do. So I type LEA, EAX, EAX, and I get an error. But, this is using the mod RM table to encode it, so of course in machine code you can still write it the wrong way, which is what I did, and my debugger tells me this is invalid, and I actually get a illegal instruction fault there. So I mean, this garbage, it screws up, but the cool thing, to me at least, is that I can write something that I couldn't in assembly, even though it like it will crash. It's still kind of cool. And then this is what? the last major section of this, this talk about the these prefix of these, and it's kind of one of my favorites. So first of all, byte swap. It's an instruction that allows you to um, swap all the bytes, like 8-bit values, um, in one register. Um, and really, you only have the option of doing a 64-bit register or a 32-bit register. You'd think, why can't I do a 16-bit register? Because there is at least two bytes in it. You would be able to just swap them. Um, you can do it with exchange if that's what you really want to do. But like in my head, I'm like, why can't I do it with a, you know, a B swap? Um, so anyway, I try to write it anyway because I want to do the wrong things. So AX is a 16-bit register. I try to do it, and you know, of course, I get an error. But there's actually, if you're writing assembly, if you write 32-bit um, operations or 8-bit operations. There is machine code dedicated for those, but if you want to do a 16-bit operation, there's, you're actually using the machine code for a 32-bit operation, and then there's a prefix that is put in front of it that overrides that into being 16-bit, and it's used a lot. There's the 6.6 and 6.7 prefixes. So that's how we get vSwap AX. Um, but yeah, like a lot of other uh, hacks like this, it turns out it doesn't actually swap the bytes. It doesn't do nothing though, and it doesn't give an error. What it actually does is clears out the AX register. So again, yet another clever way to clear out the AX register. Um, but it's still kind of interesting because um, it's a way to clear it out that actually does a thing, and it does it consistently, but you can't do it in assembly. Although you can, you know, XOR AX with AX, or move zero AX, or whatever. 
Um, then there's also the repetition prefix. Um, this is mostly for string operations. You just repeat the same operation over and over and over again, and it uh, decrements the ECX register to keep track of that. Um, but if you do that, that um, F3 prefix, it's F3 in machine code, if you prefix it with that, um, turns out that it's gonna um, just do nothing. So there's one weird exception though. Um, anybody that knows assembly, which there might be a few in the room, do you know what the machine code for a no op is? Like 90, everyone in 90s, yeah. Um, so with that in mind, this one maybe people might not know. If you do, just shout it really loud. Do you know what the machine code for pause is? Show of hands, anybody? Let's come to flex. Oh, fuck you, Joe. Um, it's F3. So, a repetition prefix, it, well, F390, I should say. F390 is pause. So, repetition prefix is F3. Voila. Machine code for no op is 90, which actually is just exchange EAX, EAX, which is another very weird little thing. Um, but being that that's the machine code for those two different things, what if I, um, if I repeated a no-op, and then just to compare, I pause right below it. So, of course, repeating uh, a no-op, it doesn't actually repeat because it's not a string-based instruction. But if I do that, disassemble it, I get that. Um, almost what you would expect, weirdly enough. But again, it's, it's cool. When you know what's going on under the hood in, in machine code, you can, you can do a pause in assembly by writing something ignorant like repeating a no-op, which is actually not a no-op at all. And that's, you know, the, the machine code and the Intel manual there to show the, the two instructions and the machine code side by side there. You got the 90, as you guys know, and then the F390 for pause, even though F3 is a repeat prefix. This one is totally trolly. There's no real good reason to do it, but I love it. So here's um, some proof of concept code from smashing the stack for fun and profit from a very old issue of Frack. Um, I modified it a little bit to be 16-bit for reasons. Um, so, what happens if you prefix a prefix? Like, if I did 66 before 66, like, does it override again? Does it like double override? Like, what is? It, it does nothing. So, take that into uh, if you combine that with the fact that in x86, the maximum instruction size in bytes you can have is 15 bytes. If you make an instruction that's 16 bytes, you get an error. I've tried. So you can do something like that, which is amazing. It's the same machine code, or same uh, program, uh, the same shell code. It logically works exactly the same, except it looks like that. So every instruction <laughs> is 15 bytes. And something about that just seems elegant to me. I love that. Because x86 is not a fixed size uh, you know, instruction set. There are some architectures that are, where um, the, the bytes of each instruction is the exact same. Like that propeller architecture I was talking about earlier, that's an example of one where every instruction actually is the same size, but Intel is so confusingly not that until you do prefix abuse. Um, and this is another example of repeating every instruction, even though it doesn't repeat because none of these instructions are actually uh, repeats or string instructions, so you got that. Um, full offsets, this is an interesting one, but say we're to look at this example. Just XOR, um, pointer racks plus racks, and then EAX is the, um, uh, the second operand. Um, so if I rewrite that in source, and then I compile it, or assemble it, not compile it, and then disassemble it again, I end up with the same kind of instruction, you know, you see in the assembly part it looks exactly the same, but the machine code is less. And, and why? Well, the reason is because in the, the machine code up here, you, you don't see it in the disassembly, but there's um, an implied 32-bit uh, offset that happens to be nulls. We put nulls in it. So we can try to trick it a little bit. We can, well, first of all, you know, I'll try to write those nulls out in my assembly, although still, interpretive dance, it doesn't listen to you um, because assembly's to my level, right? Um, yeah. But it seems like that's pointless. Why would I even go through that exercise? Well, the reason for that is because there is a multi-byte no-op, and they actually do abuse the modern RM table to do things like that, um, to make use of multi-byte uh, instructions. So I can try to replicate what Intel recommends, write those, end up with that, which is totally not what uh, Intel shows, so that's, that's garbage, that's bullshit. So maybe I can try to trick it and not put nulls in there so they can't you know, take the nulls out and um, make, it, make it smaller. Um, it gets a little bit better, a little bit closer, but still bullshit. So really you gotta write it in direct machine code. But why do that when you can just repeat a bunch of uh, prefixes, get even more bytes than they give, and have a weird ass knob sled, I don't know. So 
This is uh, just a kind of placeholder slide um, in the PDF version only, just so you can see some of the instructions that I'm going to demonstrate. Ja, wie lange geht der Talk noch? Ja gut, der geht noch irgendwie fünf Minuten oder so, dann machen wir den noch fertig, nehme ich auch weg. Um, it, it actually does uh, a force community property, but the official machine code is that, and a redundant version of it is actually less machine code. So not always does, in, uh, does your assembler try to reduce the machine code. Uh, but that's because it's a community property and kind of weird. Um, you know, I can do or EAX, you know, 50, and I get all kinds of different things for that. Um, and I'm just trying to show you like what this can do. Um, that's that fence, you know, it's doing that pretty automatically. I can do a jump at zero for, you know, one, and there's a little bit, there's like different uh, bite sizes for that. Um, I can do a really long one here. Um, and I don't know if like the speaker going to flag me, but I'm actually getting close to done, so, so you know. Um, we'll do this really long instruction here. Release, twice, yeah. So of course, community property. Like we just showed, I can take all that crap and code it for you. Um, push ECX, and I got that. It's just showing you some of the things that it can do, um, which is kind of cool. And this is not like NASM shell, where it's, it's a wrapper to, to NASM. It uh, is a full interpreter, or it's a full assembler um, written in Ruby. And no. I'll give a link to it in a second. Um, lastly, uh, I just want to show a cool trick of self modifying code. Uh, one of the other applications, this isn't just for exploitation, like if you can do machine code stuff at a little level, you can do cool tricks like self-modifying code, you can do different stego, like um, like Haydn is an example, but even more with this knowledge. Um, so just showing you like a simple thing like, you know, incrementing and decrementing with this format is really only one bit of machine code different. And I show the binary difference down there, um, which, you know, that's, that's the effective difference of that. So like if you write self-modifying code, um, you have this machine code here, um, these two examples, it's exactly Brennt the same nach oben? Code, Funktioniert das? Although, when we go through it, we have move, sub, SPV, and on the first one. But when you execute all the way through, really it's move, sub, add, ich XOR. Because it's self-modifying code, it's actually modifying that one bit for those instructions. And that trick I actually used on CactusCon coming up in September in Phoenix, Sorry. I'm doing a little talk called Boot and Play. It's all about oh, uh, you come to spell it in. Uh, games. Um, some of you at PSD or GTFO did Tetris that inspired me, so I did like a Tron game. Um, I had some other friends that did some other games that I'll be showing in there. Um, Goose, are you here? Uh, he, he wrote something cool. Yeah, okay. So, so he's co presenting me for that. Um, and then also, uh, I wrote a bunch of like crappy type puzzles that are also boost factors as well. Um, so, yeah, you guys saw the tool, and that's pretty much all of it. Uh, I don't know if I, if I have time for questions, I'll, I'll take them. If not, the games can shut you down. Um, but I left this as the last slide for links and you know, my blog, which I talk about how something's to my level. It's my Twitter, and then the two tools that I was going through. Um, so I'm assuming if there's questions, there's probably going to be a microphone, maybe. I don't know. Okay, shout a little louder, come up close. The guys of the immer noch klein sind. There's no questions, that's easier for me. Okay, Joe wants to ask a question, which is going to be terrible. What, what's, what's your question, Joe? Hauptsache, ich habe die Steine da vorher hingesetzt. Uh, oh, uh, try it, it might. I, I haven't done anything with Ida. Um, yeah, okay, no, I will. Um, he was asking if uh, doing these tricks confuses Ida Pro. So um, I haven't really um, played around with that. Because for me, those kind of things don't interest me as much, but um, it might. But I know Ida Pro is really, really good at um, dissecting, so it might not trick Ida. Um, yeah, you. Okay, so to answer the question, was there ever a point where machine code was one to one with uh, assembly? Um, for Intel uh, or x86, I, I don't know Oops. If, it's, it, if it was. It was a long time ago, um, because a lot of these weird things that I was going through is because of all the backwards compatibility. 
Um, but really, I do want to say no, just because at the, at the top of my head, one of the first things that I think of is that, that thing where you can't do a memory to memory operation. So you have to have those two different encodings, and because of that, you have that redundancy. So for that reason, oh, I'm nee. um, But that doesn't mean. I mean oh, this is sehr nervig. Um, I can almost say that it's 100% one to one. Ah, in the hülle, this is. There's like a little bit of difference. In fact. I still want to say technically that that makes it not one to one. Um, so because of that, I love propeller. Um, it, it's weird, there's no interrupts. It's, it, it's like a really weird architecture. There's like no stack and all that kind of stuff. But, um, is there any yeah, okay, then with this field, erstmal time. so gross, denke ich. Time? Okay, time. Um, I'll be in the hangout room if you guys want to. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Leute hier, das war der Talk uh, Defcon 25 X Logic X Assembly Languages to High Level. Um, ja, das war's dann auch uh, von mir an dieser Stelle. Check den Server aus, raidet unsere Base 1492 127 134. Um, ja, bin dann mal raus.